There we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, welcome to today's EATS Department New Student Orientation for Perspective LNSCS students. I am so happy that a lot of you are sharing your screen. I get to see your faces. We really wish we were on campus in a big auditorium like, I don't know, Pimentel or Wheeler. But you know what? We're in the comfort of our homes or maybe in the dorms. I see some of you looks like you're in the dorms. Um, wonderful. But yeah, we're so excited to have you here. We have a presentation ready for you. Um, we'll also answer some of your questions. So how we're going to be doing questions is that you'll be entering your questions to the chat. Um, I see a lot of you saying hello, which is so cool. So just make sure you enter your questions there. And then the advisors, we have all the CS advisors here um, that are going to be um, kind of like rooting those questions back to me. And I will be asking those questions to John when the time comes. Um, I haven't introduced myself. Welcome everyone. My name is Andrea Mejia Valencia and I am one of the LNSCS advisors. And like I said, so excited to have you here. And I think we can get started. Um, so we have Professor De Niro here with us who is gonna be um, sharing the presentation with us, answering your questions and talking to us about the program. All right, welcome. Are you ready, John? Yeah, let's do it. Thank you, Andrea. And thanks every, the whole advising team for helping put together this presentation. And thanks to all of you for, for coming. Um, I'm John. Uh, I um, have been teaching here for quite some time. It's because Berkeley is really my favorite place in the world. I love this university. I love this town. Life's a little tricky right now, I know, but you'll get to experience all of that uh, in some form or other. Uh, at some point or other, and uh, I hope you're going to love it as much as I do. Um, I am teaching the first course for majors, CS61A, this fall, so perhaps some of you are in that, and um, you'll see a lot of me, but uh, I also am the, as like an administrative role, I'm the vice chair for undergrad matters in the EECS department, and uh, that means I get to do fun things like this and also help uh, work out the policies for, you know, what courses you have to take to complete your major and things like that. So I'm going to share some slides and uh, talk about them. Give me a moment. Okay, hopefully you can see that and hear me. If not, somebody shout. And um, I have been clicking admit all in the waiting room, folks, uh, but uh, I can't do that anymore. So uh, someone else needs to keep admitting students as they show up. And uh, ask questions as we go. So um, ask them in the chat. I can't read the chat right now, but I'll stop once in a while and Andrea will uh, pick the very best most articulate questions, no, just kidding. She'll, she'll pick uh, oh, any questions that you have. We'll try to get through them. And um, and yeah, just, just tell you about a program um, and the university and whatever is on your mind, you're welcome to ask about that. So, here we go. Uh, the EECS department is home to several different majors and minors, but it also is, uh, description of the group of faculty that work on both electrical engineering and computer science and many people work on the intersection of that and uh, you know we're a very collaborative department across these two disciplines we've been joined basically for for many many decades and uh, I think we'll stay that way because we're proud of our tradition of mixing together electrical engineering and computer science as a joint discipline and uh, that means that for uh, any of the major programs, uh, LNS, computer science, the EECS program, um, we're, we're also very involved in uh, the data science program. Uh, we have a mix of coursework at the undergraduate level uh, from electrical engineering and computer science. The faculty from uh, both parts talk to each other a lot and uh, try to come up with uh, like an educational program that leads to learn how to program computers, but also uh, how they work. 
and um, and think about more than just computing, but also uh, sensors and interacting with the world and all the stuff that electroengineering um, brings. So uh, it's an integrated program, one of the few left in the United States at most universities, this is kind of split off. And, um, you know, there, there's consequences both ways, but it's a clear choice for us that we want to stay together. And um, so uh, it, kind of whatever degree program you participate in, you end up uh, doing some of both of these. Um, we work a lot in teams, you know, most of the problems that people need to solve these days in electrical engineering and computer science cannot be solved by just one person sitting alone um, in the park or in their basement or whatever. It, you really need to work with a team in order to solve meaningful problems and build meaningful things. So uh, we focus a lot on teamwork um, and we're also interested in drawing from the wonderful diversity that we have on campus, students of different interests, different backgrounds, uh, different life experiences to come together and kind of like uh, share what they know uh, in order to do something great. I think that uh, there's clear evidence that diverse teams are more effective because uh, that just means you have kind of different ideas and different ways of working. Um, so uh, we're interested in that as well. Um, just, you know, to start things off casually, let's talk about the honor code. So uh, no, I start here because the honor code is really important. Um, you know, you're now in college, and uh, for transfer students, you've been in college before, but you're now at Berkeley. And uh, this is, in some sense, like the beginning of, uh, of a new era in your life where you're building relationships that uh, are not just friends, but also might be professional in nature. You're likely to see the people that are on this call throughout your career, if you work in electrical engineering, or computer science or related areas, um, the world is surprisingly small. And a lot of the great people, the leaders out there in the world went to Berkeley. So, uh, you know, the relationships you build here matter, the way you conduct yourself here matters, and the, um, the habits you build here matter a lot in terms of how you're gonna live your life. So what I would recommend is follow the honor code. As a member of the UC Berkeley community, act with honesty, integrity, and respect for others. You're welcome to work with other people. We encourage that broadly. In every course, there's specific rules about what you need to do yourself and what you need to do with other people. Um, but there's almost always uh, great, great opportunities for collaboration. But collaboration doesn't mean copying other people's work, so don't do that. Um, and you know, in in an online environment, it's more complicated. I think it's a little bit more tempting when it doesn't seem like anyone else is watching to uh to collaborate when you're not supposed to collaborate but don't do it because um you know people run into trouble in the short term because they get caught but people really run into long term because they build relationships um and reputations of not being honorable and that could carry with you for the rest of your life so don't mess around just follow the honor code okay uh i think that's important but now i'm mostly going to talk about uh, what it's like to take our courses, what the courses are, and uh, hopefully you'll have questions about all of that. So the LNSCS major is almost identical in structure to the EECS major. The reason we built this is that we thought we came up with a recipe for how you should learn about electrical engineering and computer science jointly, and we offer this across two colleges. So uh, there's a lower division, which has six courses, Almost everybody who majors in computer science takes all six of these courses. And once you have that foundation, then you get to pick where you specialize. And so we have upper division courses in lots of different areas and um, full flexibility about which ones you take. It's really just up to you to take five. In the LNSCS major, some of them have to be related to computer science. You can't just do electrical engineering, but um, but you know you basically get to pick your area and each one of these upper division courses corresponds to some research group in the university and is typically taught by one of the uh, professors that leads that research group and um you know so so it's uh not just practically oriented of how to you know implement security but also we'll talk about the kind of research that's done here and how to have a broad perspective on on working in some sub area of computer science uh for uh, a long time. So 
how would you know which of these upper division courses to take? Well, you take the lower division courses and you learn what all these things mean. So if you don't know what architecture databases are, um, you will if you take the lower division and then you can decide which upper division courses are interesting to you. And the department itself is organized according to research groups that roughly fall along the same set of topics that you'll see in the upper division. In fact, whenever there's a new research group, a few years later, there's usually an upper division course corresponding to that, um, that uh, means that undergrads can learn about what's going on. So uh, this picture is meant to show that while um, electrical engineering and computer science are in some senses distinct, there's a lot of stuff at the intersection. And this is kind of a quirky picture, like why is robotics way over here on the left? Robotics involves a lot of computing and a lot of electrical engineering. So even some stuff that's over here is probably really close to the center. Um, in, in fact, if you look at the department and the faculty, the group of people that are closest to the intersection of electrical engineering and computer science that are kind of working in both at the same time are the youngest faculty, the ones who joined most recently. That's where a lot of the like interesting uh, action is in research these days. Okay, so um, why don't I tell you about a couple courses that you're going to take and I'll take some questions and then I'll tell you some more. Um, the typical to the typical course load will depend on whether you're a transfer student or a uh, freshman admit, but uh, most students are taking CS61A and EEC16A in their first semester. And um, these are both the beginnings of sequences. So 61A is really about how to organize programs. It's um, different than most computer science courses that are taught at other colleges and universities. And therefore, though many students come here and have prior programming experience or have even taken courses, they often take this course uh, anyway uh, because it teaches just different topics. It's really not about how to uh, use a particular technology or a particular programming language. It's much more about how to, organize, how to organize large programs so that instead of just building something small and cute, you can build things that scale and solve real world problems, um, which you know, leads to a lot of complexity that you have to figure out how to manage. And uh, so it goes through some great ideas in the history of organizing programs. These are called programming paradigms, um, things like functional programming, object-oriented programming, declarative programming. If you don't know what these things are, that's fine. That's why we teach the class these things are. So uh, if you're uh, interested in this stuff, um, but you don't quite know what all the keywords mean, don't get intimidated, just take the course. If you do know what those, these things mean, um, then, uh, you know, that's typical. I think most of the students who take this course have prior programming experience, but um, usually there's quite a bit that you haven't seen before. So in this first course, you learn how to kind of uh, solve computational problems, write programs and organize them so that they can scale up. And then in 61B, they do scale up. So 61B is a quite a different course because it's about uh, the great inventions of computing that solve particular problems. So you learn about algorithms that people have discovered for sorting a list. You don't have to invent your own, like people have come up with different ways of, of sorting something efficiently. Uh, data structures for organizing all kinds of data and solving all kinds of problems. So it's this kind of wonderful array of different uh, discoveries that have been made in computing over time. And you get to see them all and kind of add those to your toolbox of ways of solving problems uh, in the future, and also the projects where they scale. So in 61A, we give you some exposure to large projects, but we mostly show you how to structure them uh, so that you don't have to figure it out yourself. So you have some examples, but then in 61B, it's time for you to figure out how to apply what you've learned in 61A in order to organize your own large programs. So the projects in 61B um, are, are quite, um, quite intense, you know, pretty big scale. And uh, that's by design, that's to give people practice in, in writing large programs. And it's what differentiates 61B from most data structures and algorithms courses that are out there in the world, is that uh, although many of these topics are covered in um, 
in courses at other colleges and universities, I think that ours tend to involve just like a larger scale programs that you write as examples. Okay, uh, what else is on this page? Well, 61C is really where electrical engineering and computer science meet. This is about describing the structure of a machine that can execute the programs that you've learned how to write in 61A and 61B. Um, it talks about new programming techniques as well, how to manage parallelism, uh, how to write in really low level language that can be executed directly by the hardware of a machine. But a lot of it is about why computers are the way they are and how that allows you to you know, build operating systems and run large programs and things like that. Um, it's, it's normal to take 61A, B, and C in order, but you don't have to. Um, some students take uh, C after A. Uh, students with a lot of prior experience could take C right away if they want it. Uh, it's not like uh, there's a clear prerequisite chain. I think that 61A is a natural predecessor to 61B. So most students who take B have already taken A, and that's usually a good idea. But you know, if you have prior experience from courses elsewhere, um, then you can, uh, you can manipulate this plan a little bit and you'll be all right. Okay, CS70 is a math course. It's uh, about a third probability and two thirds discrete math. So what is discrete math? That's less to do with real numbers and more to do with like counting things. And uh, it's there to teach you the math and probability you need in order to take upper division courses. But it's also there to help train you in writing proofs. And this is a big part of computer science is to prove that something is going to work. Instead of just testing it out and seeing that it will work on a few examples, this is important because if you build a large complex system, every piece has to work extremely reliably for the whole thing to run. And a great way to know that something's gonna work reliably is to prove that it will do so. So uh, this is kind of essential to lots of different areas of electrical engineering and computer science. And um, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking. Like I, I know everyone's written a proof in a geometry class or something like that, but, but there's a lot of subtlety in the kind of mathematical reasoning that you do in this course. And so uh, most students take it in their second year. Now, uh, if you're a transfer student, it's not uncommon to take it in your first year uh, because you've already been to college for a while, right? But, uh, but for students who aren't transfer students or coming straight in from high school, it usually is a good idea to build up mathematical maturity, meaning uh, the ability to reason mathematically about things through other courses. And a great set of other courses to take in order to get ready for CS70 are the EEC 16A and 16B series. These have actually been renamed since this slide was created uh, to EEC courses, meaning they're a mixture of electrical engineering and computer science, because it's clear that what you learn here is foundational to both disciplines. Okay, so what is this course about? Often people take it in their first semester. It's a mixture of learning about devices and systems. So these are like actual physical things in the world and the mathematics you need in order to design and build these. And a lot of that mathematics is about manipulating information through a branch of mathematics called linear algebra. So between 16A and 16B, there's a whole linear algebra math course. In <laughs> Hello, somebody's dog. Uh, not my dog. And uh, yeah, so, um, these are very much math courses as well, kind of like CS70, except for they're more than that, because math is more interesting if you have an application for it. And the application here is to build devices and systems. So you learn about circuits, you learn about how to do signal processing, um, and you do that in the context of learning the mathematics that lets you uh, analyze these systems that you're going to build. Uh, and, and it's very much about building things that interface with the real world. So. Uh, you do things like wireless communications and learn how to touch screens work and stuff like that. And this is a two course sequence. So the second course doesn't have a very original name, Designing Information Devices and Systems 2, but it is distinct in that it has a different set of interfaces with the real world examples. Uh, it's more focused on signal processing than circuits, I think, 
Uh, it's got some robotics applications. There's a unit on brain machine interfaces. Uh, at least that's usually in there, depending on who teaches it. And um, the part of the branch of mathematics called linear algebra that you learn in 16b really is quite widely applicable to um, you know, data science and machine learning in addition to signal processing. So that's the foundation. You take these six courses, you can take them in different orders, but the most typical order would be to take 61A and 16A together, take 61B and 16B together, and then in your third semester, you would take 61C and 70. Now transfer students, uh, for example, might have already done the 61B coursework, and so that changes your schedule. Or it's possible you might wanna take three of these at once. If you have seen some of the material in each of them, that's feasible. Now, if you are relatively new to this, I don't recommend taking three of these courses in one semester. It's much better to spread them out. Um, but uh, if you have a lot of prior background, like if you're a transfer student, then that's something you could plausibly do. Um, but in general, like less is more in the sense that if you take fewer classes and you really learn what's going on in those classes, that tends to be more valuable than just getting as many classes through out of the way as possible. And this lower division, like it's not just teaching you things that let you do the real stuff in the upper division. Like these are pretty serious courses that teach you things that are useful in life and uh, in uh, your future careers. And so you should really learn what's the content of these courses instead of just like doing the bare minimum to get by. Okay, so I told you what the lower division looks like. That's how you spend your first year or two. Uh, why don't I pause for a little bit, see if there are questions so far, and then we'll move on. We have a couple questions. So the first. Uh, I think you're uh, muted, Andrea. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm good now. Yeah, but you got to start your question over. Thanks. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So it, this question goes back to the owner code. So they're asking, does using op open source code found on GitHub, etc., violate the owner code for CS? Uh, good question. It depends uh, how it was open sourced. If it was, if you're using an open source project in order to get something done, that's strongly encouraged. If you're using uh, the solutions to a course project that somebody decided to open source on GitHub because they posted it there, even though they're not supposed to, that's not okay. Like you need to uh, solve problems yourself or in collaboration with other students in the class and not just copy something that somebody posted on the web. Awesome, thank you. Now we have a couple of questions related to declaring the CS major. Um, are there any additional criteria you need to meet after the GPA to declare CS? Or once I meet the GPA, am I declare? Yeah, so declaration of the computer science major. Well, okay, let me talk about this for just a few minutes. So um, this is a lot of demand for computer science these days. Um, the nice thing is that we've scaled up our program dramatically over the last 10 years. Um, we now have like, uh, more than three times the amount of course capacity than we did. Uh, the bad news is that still wasn't enough to keep up with the demand for computing courses around here. And so, uh, there is a declaration GPA cap for declaring computer science. Um, currently, it's 3.3, uh, which is computed out of just your grades from 61A, 61B, and 70, or the subset of courses that, that you take here at Berkeley uh, from that set. And um, yeah, not, not everybody meets that threshold who was originally intending to major in computer science. It's typically not a disaster. If you don't major in computer science, you could still take the lower division. These courses are generally large enough that uh, almost everybody can take all of them. Uh, each 16B is a little bit impacted these days. Uh, but for the most part, um, these courses are open. And some of the upper division courses are quite open. Like we have lots of students who aren't computer science majors taking the upper division courses. Some of them aren't, right? So uh, the reason that we have a GPA cap is that we don't have enough capacity for everybody to take so many upper division courses that they could major in computer science. We are still working on that. 
hard. Um, but um, yeah, for various reasons, we haven't been able to keep up. I, I think the main reason is that the interest in computer science and the number of students on campus overall grew much faster than uh, anybody uh, was was ready for. And so we've uh, really done a lot of work to expand, but um, but not everything. So what's the declaration process? You take 61A, 61B, and 70, and then you apply. If your grades in those courses, your GPA, uh, meets the threshold of 3.3, then yes, you can declare. And there's nothing else you really have to do except for submit your uh, application to declare. If you're below the GPA threshold, there is an appeals process. Um, but um, for the most part, you know, students who are above the GPA threshold get in and those that are below. Awesome. Yes. And going along with that question, um, we had this question. Since the prereqs are ingraded on a curve, do you accept everyone with the GPA cap? What happens if a large number of students get the GPA compared to the allowed class size? Yeah, good question. So this has certainly happened. We generally don't grade on a curve in um, these courses. So there's some variation, uh, but I don't grade on a curve and uh, many of my colleagues don't because we don't want to encourage competition among students. Like it, it's better if you just focus on learning yourself instead of being better than somebody else. And as a result, the grade distribution does fluctuate over time. Um, students, well, I guess I'll, I'll just tell you how it is. Like grades in general have gone up a little bit over the last few years. And I, I suspect that's because students are uh, uh, really focusing more on these courses, which I think is great. And um, you know, the GPA threshold probably has something to do with that. I would love to tell myself that it's just because of your love of learning. And for many of you, that's exactly what will motivate you to work hard on these courses. But of course, like uh, the ability to declare is something um, that, you know, we're basically rooting for you for. Um, and, and, you know, what happens when more students uh, are able to declare than we planned on? Well, we find ways to create more course capacity. And so we have been building more and more course capacity by adding new courses or expanding existing courses every year for the last 10 years at a rapid rate. Um, and so, you know, what happens if more people declare than we really planned for? Well, that has happened and uh, still people are graduating on time. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. I would say um, that, uh, you know, it's very motivating as faculty to see students perform well in our courses. And so uh, if you work hard and you do well, and as a group, you, um, you get a very high set of grades in these lower division courses, well, then uh, that will inspire us to find more course capacity in the upper division to the best we can. Not that we're not working really hard on that already. But yeah, so, so don't worry about it too much. Um, this is a pretty large population. So therefore it's somewhat predictable how people will do. Awesome, let's do two questions that are still related to this and then we can move on with the presentation. Okay, great. Um, and I can also help you answer these. So um, a student is asking, when should students declare? Is there a, a time limit to declare? Oh, good, I'll um, turn that over to you. Yeah, so usually students end up declaring the major sometime their sophomore year, beginning of junior year. Um, if there is a limit to declare in the College of Letters and Science, students need to declare a major the semester before their last. So that's kind of like the deadline that you want to have. Um, but like I said, typically students um, end up declaring their sophomore year, beginning of junior year. Um, so the next question, um, under any circumstance, can we retake any of the prerequisites if we don't get the grade we needed? I know there's an appeal process, but is there any way to retake the prereqs if you have a semester or two before your sophomore year ends? And I can also answer that question. Um, so for the prerequisites, so CS 61A, 61B, and CS 70, um, the prerequisites to declare the CS major, you are able to repeat the courses, but you do have to remember that as a policy of repeating uh, courses at UC Berkeley, you can only repeat courses in which you obtain a D plus or below. So you're able to repeat a course, um, but what's going to happen if it's CS 61A, B, or 70, we're going to take an average of the two grades. So for example, you take CS 61A and you get a D minus, and then you retake it and you get an A. We'll take both of the grades along with the grade that you get in 61B and 70 to um, do the average uh, of the GPA for declaration. 
Um, so yeah, those are the questions that we have right now, but let's move on and then we'll get to more questions in a little bit. All right, thanks folks. We have a website. You should read it. It has a lot of information on there. Uh, and um, now you know where it is, expertly.edu resources undergrads. Google will find it for you as well. The lower division coursework is generally challenging for students. You know, people's experience level varies, their amount of free time, what's going on in their life varies, um, how quickly things just click varies. So I can't tell you exactly what it's gonna be like for you, but the general sentiment is that these courses are more challenging than, um, than courses that students have taken previously either at other colleges or uh, in high school. There's a reason for that, and it's not to torture you, and it's not really to force people out, although it can feel like that sometimes. Uh, these courses were challenging before we had a GPA cap. Um, these courses are challenging because the population of students we have here is very talented, very able, and very ambitious, and uh, you're capable of a lot. Uh, but the amount you learn is going to depend on the amount of work that you put in. That's just how learning works. And so we try to come up with uh, courses that are at a pace and a volume of content that really can keep students uh, learning a lot and kind of uh, maximizing their potential. So the quirky thing is that these courses are hard for different reasons. So um, if you ask students like which one's the hardest, you'll get a lot of different answers. And that's because, you know, people are more comfortable with different things. And uh, these courses are, are hard for different reasons. So 61A tends to be uh, difficult for students because of the conceptual understanding uh, of how to think about programs, how to reason abstractly, um, things like that. Or 61B, usually like if you've taken 61A, you're good at that stuff already. And now the problem is that the assignments are just huge. And in 61C, um, well, the assignments are big, but also there's just a lot of detail to learn about how computers work, like they're complicated devices, and uh, that can really stretch people. The X 16A, B, and 70 is, is best thought of as a series. I mean, it's not like 70 has prereqs of 16A and B, but certainly you do get a uh, really nice experience with mathematical reasoning of thinking about proofs if you take these courses in that order. And, um, and all of them really challenge students because of the sophistication of mathematical reasoning that we expect. Um, and you know, you need that in order to solve really hard problems in EECS, but, uh, but it takes a while to build that muscle, to, to learn how to reason mathematically. So um, in addition to having these kind of course specific challenges, there's always a lot of work and there's always a lot of fast coverage and um, you know the work is there in order to make sure you get the practice you need to learn this well. Um, it's uh, sometimes we do studies of like you know if we make some piece of work optional, do the students who do it do better on the exams? Yes. Now that doesn't prove causation, but it's a reasonable signal that like doing the work uh, is is probably a good way to help prepare yourself for demonstrating that you actually know how to do something. So. Um, you know, that's just the reality is that these courses are challenging. We want you to learn a lot. Uh, you're only here for so long. Um, this is a good reason to not take too many at the same time and to make sure that the other courses you're taking in your schedule allow you to dedicate sufficient time to each of these courses while you're taking it. There are students who have taken similar courses and you should talk to an advisor about whether you should even take the lower division. The answer is often yes, even though you think it might be no. You might think, well, how could I take an intro course in computer science? I've been studying computer science for years. And yet, uh, we survey students at the end, and almost all of them, except for just a handful, say that they were glad they took the course and didn't skip out of it. So uh, that said, there is a handful of students every year who uh, really would be better off not taking, for example, 61A or 61B, and instead uh, moving on. But Oftentimes, there's just a part of those courses that they didn't get in their previous coursework. And so we have bridge courses called the 47 series, which just cover like a part. So for example, 
if you've studied everything in 61A except for weeks 10 through 13, then you would take 47A, which is a one unit self-paced course in which you would just cover those few weeks right there at the end, the part that usually isn't covered anywhere else. And then, uh, then you'll have the whole picture, right? You'll have uh, taken whatever prior coursework you have that heavily overlaps with 61A, and you'll have gotten the part uh, that we kind of only teach you. So if you think that's appropriate, you can talk to uh, the faculty, you can talk to me, uh, but uh, who knows best is probably the advisors. So um, set up an advising appointment, but if, if that's not happening in a timely manner, you know, don't, don't be shy about contacting instructors directly. Um, so if you're in 61A and you don't think you should be there because you uh, have seen all this coursework already, uh, then let me know. Strategies for success. Don't overload yourself. Do not take all the courses at once. You will not learn everything that you need to learn. And courses are not there just to check them off. They're not there so that you can prove to somebody else that you took this course. They're there for you to actually learn the material. And that takes time, that takes dedication, and that takes uh, enough room in your schedule in order to really be able to focus. So taking too many courses at once is a common but almost always problematic choice that students make. Um, if you are compelled to take many courses, at least reevaluate after a couple of weeks and realize that you can drop courses up to the fourth week. And if you're overloaded, in week three, you're definitely gonna be overloaded in week 10. So you might as well just drop something, take it a future semester, um, and, uh, and it's not a big deal. Like students, uh, yeah, they think they have to pack a lot in, but really uh, having high quality experiences is better than having like a lot of quantity. Don't fall behind, uh, especially in an online semester. It's so easy to fall behind. You know, there's just like, uh, there's everything's recorded and you could just wait till next week to watch it but don't do that because it's so hard to catch up when you're behind it's like taking twice as many courses if you're behind and you're trying to catch up at the same time that you're trying to keep up with all the new material there just aren't a lot of breaks in a semester um so when something comes out do it then don't wait till the deadline and uh when a you know, lecture happens watch it that day don't wait till the weekend uh, just do whatever you can to keep up when you have questions, ask. Um, in an online format, it's extra awkward to ask questions, but just do it anyway. Um, find academic teammates and take classes together. So, uh, you know, one of the, well, it's clearly the best thing about Berkeley is the community here. Like the people are just amazing. It's nice, the, the views of the Bay are nice too when it's not full of smoke, but um, but really, it's, it's the people that come here that are attracted to this place and want to be here um, that make it special. And you're going to find some of these people that you're excited about working with. It takes a while. Uh, like, I look back at my time in college, which was some time ago, and um, of my best friends, I think I made two in my first year, and then one in my second, and one in my third, and one in my fourth. And uh that fourth one was the best of all she became my wife and still is so uh you know it's not like uh you're going to meet everybody that is important to you in your first week uh or in your first orientation session or something like that but um over time you are going to accumulate relationships and um that's a good idea you can team up uh take classes together learn to work together and that can make that process more enriching more fun and uh, more productive but don't just work together, work with us. So the course staff um, for every course is there to help you succeed. And uh, oftentimes what they offer is optional. It's different than high school where, um, you know, you have to show up to class at a certain time and you have to do various things and you kind of do what you're told. Here, you have a bunch of work you have to get done, but it's up to you whether you try to solve it all yourself or whether you make use of the course resources. And the students who are most successful are the ones who come in to office hours, uh, talk to the course tutors and TAs, uh, work with their fellow students, you know, ask for help when they need it, instead of uh, pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to do everything themselves. There's a course called Education 98 Strategies for Success that I think you can enroll in. Um, and most importantly, help each other out. You know, we don't grade on a curve here. Uh, 
for most courses, we were really interested in having everybody learn a lot. Like you're all here in order to get the most out of this place. And, um, you know, your ranking is not interesting to me at all. Uh, the fact that you individually can do things that you couldn't do before at the end of the semester, that's really interesting to me. Um, and if you can get even farther by helping each other out, well, that's great. And that's usually how it goes. Um, so if you see someone who's uh, struggling, you know, and you're interacting with them somehow, like to take the time to help them out, um, to help them understand. Certainly don't be disparaging. There's no value in that. And remember that, you know, the people you work with here, well, you'll cross paths with them later in life. So, you know, don't be a jerk now. Um, and you can actually learn a ton by trying to teach somebody else how to do something. That's one of the most valuable things you can do in college. Okay, let me take a break, take some questions. I was thinking, John, maybe we should get through the slides so we can make sure we finish the presentation and leave the questions to the very end since we're at 1047 right now. What do you think? Okay, let's see what else we got. Oh, awesome. advising and support. This is the best part of the presentation. You're right, we should do this. So we have an amazing advising team. And uh, Andrea, you've met. Uh, the other folks are on the call. I don't know if you all want to show up and wave or something like that. Um, but uh, here are the pictures. It's just like totally incredible what, what a team has come together to help focus uh, with these students, um, th to help students focus on learning this stuff. Uh, they're here to support you. They know so much about how the university works. This is not something you're expected to find out just by like reading the website. You really do have to talk to people to make an academic plan. Um, and that's what the advising team is there to help you do. Uh, cool. I see some of you waving. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great that you have this support. Please use it. Uh, another kind of support that you may need is for your own mental health and, uh, you got to take this seriously. So we're in a very difficult time right now and people's circumstances vary, but this pandemic, you know, at the very least it's inconvenienced to everybody. But um, for many people, it's really caused uh, family tragedy and hardship. Um, the stress of college is, uh, is serious. Um, courses can feel overwhelming. Interpersonal relationships can feel overwhelming. That's just how life is. It's complicated. But uh, if you don't take care of yourself, then you can't succeed academically and you certainly won't enjoy it. So um, one option is to seek counseling. The Tang Center offers this. There's also a staff psychologist in the College of Engineering. Um, I think there's actually three now. They've increased the staffing. And um, here's a phone number you can call, leave a message if you want to reach out. And uh, there's also after hours emergency consultation. So um, yeah, I, I think like if things get really hard, I, I really hope that you'll reach out to someone. Um, if you don't reach out to the counselors directly and you reach out to me, well, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, but at the same time, I'll probably uh, redirect you to the pros because they're there to, to help you succeed here by making sure that your mental health is, is in order. And we have some events coming up. Please join the following student-led events. You can find these by looking for Eeks Welcome Week on Facebook. And these are happening this week. There's a session about the CS Eeks experience at Cal on Thursday. And there's a social on Friday. OK, that's all the slides. Awesome. So now let's go over some questions. Um, and I can answer along the way as well. Um, one that I think is really important, can any of these classes be taking pass no pass, such as 16A if they don't count for the GPA? So all the courses that are for the CS major, lower division or upper division, must be taken for a letter grade, even if they're not the courses that you need for declaration. So please, please, very important, must be taken for a letter grade. Um, sometimes transfer students might come with um, credit with Math 54, and remember that you can take 
Math 54 or X 16A, then students in that case can choose to take 16A as a pass no pass because they already have credit for Math 54. Um, yeah, so I really wanted to make sure to answer that question. Other than that, um, for you, John, how are office hours gonna be worked um, during online, during the online team? online period right now? Yeah, good question. So, you know, most students come to office hours not to talk to me, but to talk to one of the course tutors in order to help make progress on a problem. There's no way I can help everybody. I do love to help students work through problems, but uh, there's only one of me. And so uh, we have an online system where you can enter a queue to get help, where basically you're gonna have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, Zoom or Hangout session with a tutor or you can make appointments. Uh, those appointments are not available yet. They'll kind of become available each week. Uh, some people do want to talk to me. So um, I'm going to hold a Q&A session about lecture every morning of the lecture. So I'll post the lecture videos on Thursday. And then on Friday morning, I'll hold a Q&A session over Zoom um, where students can ask questions about lecture as if they had you know, come to a live lecture. I'm going to record those, but edit out the students. So if you come, you don't have to worry about being on display. Um, but if you don't come, it means you can hear some of the uh, answers to student questions. And um, yeah, so that's how I'll hold office hours and I'll hold them jointly with my co-instructor, uh, Hani Farid in 61A. Awesome. So this question, um, as an LNSCS major, if I become interested in a field on the intersection of EE and CS, like robotics, would it be feasible for me to pursue such a field? My, ma my main concern is that my major would not indicate any proficiency in EE, although I would take EE classes. Yeah, good question. I think you can certainly pursue this. Uh, the, the secret that maybe no one has told you yet is that what you know and what classes you've taken or it's actually more important than what is on your degree. No one actually looks at your diploma. They do interview you. They look at the skills and coursework that you've listed on your resume. Um, so if you're interested in robotics, I don't think that having a degree in computer science instead of electrical engineering is going to hold you back as long as you take the appropriate coursework and you know what you're doing. All right, let me see, thank you for that. Um, will CS61A cover basic Python syntax in the first few weeks, or should we already know it? Yeah, good question. We do cover everything from scratch. Uh, the first few weeks move really fast if you don't know anything at all, and that's okay, as long as you can make a lot of time for it. Uh, so there are students who uh, successfully take the course and enjoy it and do well, who don't have any prior experience. But, uh, but there really is a lot to learn if you haven't seen any of it before. Um, and for that reason, a lot of students have a better experience if they take some prior course, not just to like familiar, familiarize themselves with Python, but to familiarize themselves with programming in general. If you've programmed in another programming language, you have enough experience to jump into 61A. But if you're really starting from scratch and you don't even really uh, know how programs work and how to organize them because you've never written one, then it is a really good idea to think about taking another course before 61A. Not because it's a prerequisite, not because we won't cover the material, but because there's just so much in the first few weeks that it's hard to kind of get it all to sink in. So um, yeah, so I recommend if you're starting from scratch that you uh, enroll and take a look at CS10, which is called the beauty and joy of computing. It's beautiful. It's joyous. It's a wonderful course. And um, you could even kind of shop that, you know, attend the lectures at the same time that you're attending the first few lectures of 61A and see which one is a better fit for you. I can't tell you in advance because some students have done it both ways and enjoyed it. But in general, I'd say that students without any prior experience are better off taking another course before 61A. Um, that applies typically, not to everybody, but typically. Whereas students who have taken any kind of prior computing course can uh, can keep up pretty well. Awesome, thank you, John. Um, should you take EEC 16A and EEC 16B prior to CS70? It is a great idea to take 16A and 16B before 70. I think they build on each other in terms of increasing your mathematical maturity and ability to reason about kind of subtle mathematical arguments. 
and that's what you do in 70 and the more comfortable you are with that the easier 70 is because 70 has a lot of like specific material you know facts you have to learn and uh, arguments you have to follow uh, but it also uh, really relies on your um, building comfort and making uh, proof-based arguments and that's not something that comes to anybody overnight so 16a and 16b are a great way to get good at that before you take 70. Awesome. Um, a student is asking, why are CS61A, 61B, and 70 the specific courses chosen, chosen for the GPA cap? Um, and is the grading any difficulty different for those prerequisites if I take them in the summer? Mm, two good questions. Uh, we wanted a small set so that students would have an answer soon. You know, we used to have um, GPA computed based on seven courses and and students wouldn't know whether they were going to uh, be allowed into the major or not until the end of their junior year. That's no good. So we, we kind of picked the smallest subset that we thought was representative of the kinds of courses that students typically take in the upper division. And um, it's not perfect, very plausible that people should uh, really understand the material in the other lower division courses and in their uh, other breadth courses and things like that. But we tried to just pick a really small set. Um, what about the summer versus the regular school year? The, um, the grading is not explicitly different in the summer versus the fall and the spring. But I can't really prove to you that they're consistent because the populations are very different. You know, in the summer, um, it's not just like a random sample of Berkeley students. There's some students from, uh, from other campuses there. And uh, yeah, and there's some self-selection. So I don't know, but I, I don't think it's like a generally reliable strategy to take things in the summer to get a better grade. Uh, as far as I know, we try to be consistent, but I'm not sure that we are 100% of the time. All right, let me see where we have just enough time for a very last question. Um, let's see, any recommendations on courses, minors, resources for someone interested in front end programming? Oh, good question. So um, we have a human computer interaction course that covers this as an upper division course. So that would be a good choice. But actually, a lot of students learn a lot about uh, front end programming through both personal projects and through decals. So there's a web programming uh, decal, there's an iOS decal. These are courses that are run by students, but they're like shockingly well run. And well, I, I shouldn't be shocked. Like the students here are amazing. So it's no surprise at all to me that, that they're well run. But you might be shocked by the fact that a student run course can teach you so much. But there are some really good ones out there. Um, so definitely take a look at uh, the decals, especially the ones associated with the EECS department. And um, yeah, and there's lots of opportunities to learn about front end programming that way. Awesome. So there were a couple of other questions that we won't be able to get to, but you all can always email us. It's just cs-advising at cs.berkeley.edu. We will be, I'm sure we're going to be sending a follow-up email with the slides as well with the recording of this session. Um, but I just wanted to thank you, John De Niro, for helping us out with this presentation, the advising staff for helping us answer questions in the chat, helping me relay the questions to you, Anton Davis and everyone here for coming. Any last minute words, John, for the students? Yeah, welcome to Cal. It's so great that you're here. Thanks for coming today. Keep asking those questions. Uh, you'll get your answers soon enough. Uh, come meet the advisors, come meet the faculty. If you find that it's hard to get access to advisors or faculty in the first week, that's because we're busy the first week, but just keep at it. And there's plenty of time uh, to, to get to know whoever you want to get to know, as long as you're persistent. So do that. Uh, welcome to Cal and go Bears. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and we'll be waiting for your emails. Go Bears. <laughs>